friend, today we're gonna make a really fun project that's... Nope. Yeah, we're gonna make something... Am I going insane? I am the only person on this ship, right? Ignore her. Today we're gonna learn about interrupts with the Arduino. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to do more than one thing at a time with the Arduino. A simple example of that is having one LED blink continuously while another one only blinks with the press of a button. This isn't as simple as just using the same type of code that we've done for the LEDs and the push buttons before though. To achieve this type of result, we're gonna to need to use an interrupt. Interrupts make the Arduino stop what it's doing and move to a different task. The Arduino goes back to the original task once the interrupt task is completed. Two types of interrupts are hardware and timer interrupts. A hardware interrupt is triggered by some kind of external event like the press of a button or a sensor signal. A timer interrupt is triggered by the internal timer within the Arduino. Today we're only going to get some practice with hardware interrupts. On a laptop or desktop computer, pressing a keyboard key or moving the mouse triggers an interrupt. The keyboard or mouse is essentially requesting software intervention from whatever it was doing prior to pressing the key or moving the mouse. An interrupt is the method of finding out that the hardware is requesting some kind of service. The software that handles the interrupt is called an interrupt service routine, or ISR. An ISR is a subroutine, which is a set of instructions that are needed repeatedly by the program. If you're familiar with programming at all, this sounds pretty similar to defining functions. In Python, you might create functions like this or this. And in C++ or within the Arduino IDE here, we often use something like this. While there are some similarities, there's some key differences between interrupts and function calls. ISRs are executed after receiving a hardware interrupt, while functions are executed when they're called within the program. Typically, ISRs are time critical. They need to be executed quickly so that the system can continue operating as normal. A function can be executed whenever and isn't time sensitive. ISRs can't take input or return values, while function calls can. We'll go through some examples of this when we get to writing the code today. To create an ISR, you first write a special kind of function that takes no parameters. Then you tell the processor when you want the interrupt to be triggered. The ISR contains the code that's going to be executed whenever this external event happens that triggers the interrupt. ISR should be short and fast and only one interrupt can be run at a time. You can't use the millis, micros, or delay functions within an ISR because these all depend on interrupts themselves. Instead, you can use delay microseconds to do the same thing. Serial.print has a similar issue as the IDE uses interrupts for serial reading and writing. Variables that are shared between the ISR function and any other function need to be declared as volatile, like this space cat I found. Doing so tells the compiler that this variable could change at any time. This makes the compiler reload that variable each time that you reference it. Not declaring the variable as volatile could make it inaccurate. Take button state, for example. When we first declare our variables, we're making this a volatile int. We're referencing it in both the ISR and setup functions. If the state of the button changes while the program is not currently running the ISR, the button state within the ISR might not get updated to the new value. Declaring it as volatile ensures that the variable is reloaded each time in case it's been updated outside the interrupt. Space Cat, I only have so much time in a day to do this. In this project, we want to have one LED blinking continuously while the other one only blinks when you press a button. In order to do this, we're going to have to use an interrupt. We'll need eight jumper wires, the breadboard, two 1000 ohm resistors, two LEDs, and a push button. There's so much cat hair everywhere. At least Space Dog only snores in the background. Okay, code. Button pin. That is the one connected to the push button. Button LED. That is the LED that we're going to control with the push button. And blink LED is the one that is going to be blinking continuously. 
And then here's where we get to that button stay as the volatile int. Okay, void LED interrupt, that is our interrupt function. Button stay, we're reading in the button pin, whether it's pressed or not. Then we've got these two if statements. If the button stay is high, write to the push button LED low, turn it off. If the button stay is low, write to the button LED, turn it on high. Now, obviously what we want, pushing the button down turns the LED on. So this looks kind of backwards. This was a super confusing concept to me when I first got started. So quick explanation is that beginner tutorials will typically give you high for pressing a button down. It's not, it's not incorrect, but it's not the more correct way to do it. The reason that low is an easier way to use it for the button being pressed down has to do with the fact that Arduino has these built-in pull-up resistors. But to make sense of that, you kind of have to think about it in a backwards way. So we're doing it here the more correct way. So if this doesn't make sense to you as is, don't stress about it. It's something we're going to talk about in a lot more detail in an upcoming video. Just in this context, just know for now that pressing the button down is low, but that is turning it on. In void setup, we have got three pin modes that we need to set. The first one is a new thing. For the button pin, not just your standard input or output, we're going to do input pull up. And this is related to that high or low thing from within the interrupt. What input pull up means is that that pin is going to be used as an input and the default for it is going to be high unless it is pulled to low by something like pressing the button. Then our usual output just to both of the LEDs for pin mode. Finally, we've got a new function, attach interrupt. Attach interrupt has got three parameters and the first one is the interrupt number. This is going to be either zero or one. Interrupt pins are all the digital pins, but you can't use all of them. They're only connected to certain ones, depending on which Arduino board that you have. For the Uno, the digital pins are two and three. Interrupt number zero is connected to two, and then interrupt number one is connected to three. This is also the same for the Arduino Nano or Mini, but then the bigger boards can use a lot more digital pins than just these two you can use with the Uno. We're using the first argument to do it a little bit easier of a way though. We're going to use the function digital pin to interrupt instead of having to remember the interrupt number. Digital pin to interrupt just takes the pin number that you're using instead of doing the zero or the one. Here we're using button pin because we've already set that to two when we declared our variables at the beginning. The second argument that we have to enter is LED interrupt. We have to put in the ISR that we're calling here. The third argument we're using is the interrupt mode, which there are four options for. We're using change because that one is triggered when either the signal goes from low to high or from high to low. The push button is going to be back and forth, either or, so that's why we're using change. Your other options are rising, falling, or low. Rising is when it goes from low to high, falling is when it goes from high to low, and then with low, the interrupt gets triggered whenever the signal is just low. Finally, we've got a simple void loop that's just blinking that LED back and forth. High, delay, low, delay. So here's some examples of those key differences we were discussing earlier between function calls and ISRs. Pin mode, digital write, digital read, these are all functions. We can put them anywhere we want to within the code. But for LED interrupt, we're only putting within attach interrupt since that's only going to be executed when we get that hardware input. Also notice that for LED interrupt, we're not putting in any input or return values, whereas these function calls, digital write, we've got blink LED high, and pin mode, we've got button LED output. You can put in input or return values for functions. And now, thanks to interrupts, we have no difficulty having the light turn on with the push button while the other one stays blinking. Awesome. Great. What we do know is that interrupts can be really useful for having two things happen at once. Here's what we don't know. Was she the hallucination or am I? Oh no! 